We are very lucky to have us with us today, Cody Adam. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for having me here today, guys. Uh, the thing that I want to say first is that I take what we can achieve and what we can do as humans very seriously. Uh, obviously, it's why I wrote a book about it. I, however, do not take myself that seriously. So I want to have fun over these next 50 minutes, and I also really want you guys to participate. Is that something we can do? Is that good? Yeah. Okay, when I say good, let's pump up the energy a little bit. Let's get some good vibrations. If I say good, you all say good. Good? Good. Okay, all right. So let's talk about fear for a second. Oh, that's not going to slide for me. Oh, there it is. Okay, does anyone know who this? Oh, shoot, I cheated. Okay, so you probably can guess it now, but there, I always like to look at what happened in history on the day that I'm going to give a talk to an audience. So I looked up what happened on December 5th in history. Was there anything meaningful that happened on this date that we can use as a catalyst for a conversation today? Now, because I wasn't very good at my clicker, you kind of got a little precursor. Does anyone know who that person was? Say that in louder for me. Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. So Nelson Mandela died on December. Oops, that's just not working very good. Maybe I'll just use the keyboard. Okay, so Nelson Mandela, he spent 30 years, almost 30 years in prison uh, fighting the apartheid in South Africa, and then he turned that into becoming their very first black president. That is winning, right? And so when you look at uh, this quote from him, it says, I never lose, I either win or I learn. And I thought, wow, what an amazing quote for today, because I think that it's so true. So they talk today that I have a podcast called Winning the Moment Podcast. And one of the questions I love to ask people, because I think you can get lost in winning and losing, I mean, too focused on winning and never appreciating your losses. So I love to ask people, what's the biggest loss you've ever had? And it's always the question that takes the longest to respond. And I don't know if it's because they're trying to be strategic and pick a loss that doesn't seem so bad, or if it's that really when we lose with enough of a runway, it no longer feels like a loss. Because if you ask Nelson Mandela about spending his time in prison, he probably wouldn't have become the president had he not done that. So whatever it is that you're going through, whatever emotions that you're having, if you're struggling with something, nothing is forever, good or bad, right? Like you just can't stay somewhere for the entire time. And so I think this is a really powerful message that we really don't ever lose in life. We're either going to win or we're going to learn something. And I hope that today that will be true for all of you guys. We go back, hey, yep, that's what I want. So uh, this slide skipped on me because the clicker. Go back one, oh, do it for me, AJ, one the other way. Okay, so this is Paulo Cello. He is the author of my all-time favorite book, The Alchemist. This is really what got me started on my journey. And he said, there's only one thing that makes a dream impossible to achieve. And that is the fear of failure. And today I'm gonna to ask you guys to participate with me on a couple of things. And sometimes that can be scary and you may not wanna ask a question, but I'm gonna challenge you guys today to all be uncomfortable. Because that's really when we grow is when we're uncomfortable. And so even for me as, as, as I'm working on becoming a speaker and I've spoke all over the place now, every time before I do I'm a little bit afraid. Right, bless you. Even on my way here today, a part of me is like, oh, I don't really want to do it. Even though I do want to do it, but it's that fear that we all have when we're trying to go after something we want. So today, when I ask for your participation, please just lean into fear. If you're afraid of, of saying something silly or stupid or even just letting your peers hear your voice, don't let that stop you and really lean into being uncomfortable. Is that good? good. Is that good? good? There it is, that's better. Okay, go ahead for me. One more. Okay, so who am I? So they gave me a little bit of an introduction so you guys have an idea of who I am. Uh, my business is based out of Southern Utah, but I've always been an entrepreneur at heart. So AJ, if you go one more for me. This is where my entrepreneurial journey started. So I'm a little bit older than you guys, but when I was a kid, we all had these. And my very first business was taking all the food in my pantry, filling this up, and then going to all my neighbors and selling it. That was my first, my first job ever as a salesperson. And I did really well. My dad didn't love it because he didn't like paying for the food that I then just sold to all of my friends. So eventually said I couldn't do that anymore. So then I got thinking, as every second grader does, what's the next business I can start? And so we had an unfinished basement at our house at the time. And I grew up in this really great neighborhood that had kids all around it. And it was in a circle, so it was really easy to navigate. And I thought, well, the best business for a second grader is probably something called the all-night midnight bar. 
Now, why would a second grader come up with that name? I honestly don't know why I named it that. But what I did is I built a little makeshift gift shop in my basement. And I took all my old toys that I had and I made like a little store and I sold those to all the neighborhood kids. And then I also sold like sandwiches and sodas and, and whatever else you could make. And I had such a delusion sense of confidence. I still remember the first day I made like $22 and some change. And my dad's best friend, he owned a bar there in Cheyenne, Wyoming, where I grew up, called Four Winds. And I remember thinking to myself, there's no way he made more money than I did on my first day. <laughs> because I didn't really have a concept of money and I was just confident in my abilities. So I ran the All Night Midnight Bar for a while. I can't remember for sure how long. And the next journey of mine uh, was I created a movie theater. So when I was young, we had things called VHSs. I don't know if you guys know what those are. And so you used, my aunt used to always record all the movies on like HBO and Showtime. And so I had hundreds of movies. And so I built a little tiered seating in my basement on like our little 32 inch tube TV. And I would go around all the neighborhood kids and let them know what movies I was showing today. I think it charged like two or $3 to go watch a movie at my house. So ultimately I was just really charging my friends to come hang out with me, but it worked out really well. And what I realized is that this is just who I am. It's just built inside of me. So when I was going to school at first, for a minute there, I thought that I might go to school. Uh, when I was a freshman, I was working towards getting that GPA and trying to hit the milestones that I needed. But as I got into high school, I realized it just wasn't for me. Because my parents were never going to pay for school for me, so I knew I could get a business loan or I could get a school loan. And I opted to start my first business. And so I started my first company when I was 19. It was called The Cell Phone Guy. It was with this awesome, awesome uh, wireless company called Altel that does no longer exist. And so when I started that, it was very challenging. It was hard. I really didn't know much about business. I didn't know how to do QuickBooks. I didn't know inventory. I didn't understand cost management. All of those things that I had to learn along the way. But what I did do is I paid attention to what was happening around me. And there was something that happened in 2008 that was really important. Does anyone know what that is? economic crash, right? And so I was fortunate to sell my business in April of 2008. And it's not that I knew that a crash was coming. I, I wasn't that smart. But what I did see is that Altel had sold all of its shares to Goldman and Sachs. And Goldman and Sachs is not in the wireless business. They're in the investment business. And I knew that Altel had some really great service coverings, right, that other companies didn't have and they were more valuable separated into pieces than they were as a whole. So I knew that Goldman and Sachs was going to sell it. And because I was aware and I was just paying attention to the signs in the universe, I was ultimately able to put my business for sale and I was really fortunate to sell it in April of that year. The crash really kind of happened in October is when it got really bad. And so really that's just a, a message about being aware of your surroundings. So then I wasn't sure what I was going to do after I sold my business because I was still very young at this time. And there was a position that came up with a company called Wireless Advocates. So if you guys have ever been to Costco, they sell the, key, the cell phones in the kiosks there. And I lived in St. George at the time and there was an opening for the manager position. And mind you, I'd actually never managed anyone at this time because I just ran my store by myself, open to close every day, and I couldn't make enough money to live off the store, so I went and sold timeshares after the store was closed at nighttime. But being that I owned the store, I was perceived as qualified to be a manager, and so they, they hired me in the position. At the time, there was about 400 uh, Costco's in the United States, and this particular location in St. George ranked 387 out of 400, so we weren't very good. Uh, but what I realized is that it wasn't the location that was stopping them, it was the mindset of the people who worked there because they believed it wasn't good. And ultimately, whatever you believe is going to be true. And so we just changed the way we thought about it. Instead of looking at our goal for the month, we said, well, what do we have to do in the next two hours? And who's ahead of us? Who's 386? Let's just be better than them. And eventually that started to work and we built some momentum. And in the short time that I was there, it was about 10 months. It became the number one location in the United States. And the reason I share that story is because it's not about circumstance. It's about actions and behaviors, right? It's not where you at, it's, it's what you do. And so I was lucky at that point to be promoted to a district manager with that company. And I was the youngest district manager in the company's history at the time. Usually openings are for bad markets, right? Someone got fired, so you get an opportunity. So I took over what was another really challenged market, and this was in Phoenix. Took me a while to figure out how to do that role. In fact, I really struggled. I remember thinking at one point, like, I'm for sure getting fired because I was not good at it. Because I went from managing no one 
to managing four people in a four by four box, that's pretty easy, to managing a bunch of locations across an entire state, that's very difficult. That's a, a lot of a different management strategy. So it took me about six months to figure out how to do that. And I set a goal at the end of that year. I said, next year, I'm gonna be the best district manager in the company. I think there was 43 of us at that time. And that was an outlandish goal because I, I, I certainly didn't have the skill set or the background or the team yet to be able to do that. But I knew if I put that out in the universe and I shared it with everyone who was willing to listen, I was gonna be able to achieve that. And I was very fortunate that next year to become the district manager of the year. Now in sales, it's really challenging because what you achieve becomes your expectation. Right? Any company would do that. They want to make as much money as, as possible. They want to increase their revenues. So now that I'd had that performance, that was the expectation for me the following year. So no one in that company had ever gone back to back as district managers of the year. And I was able to do that in the following year. Got recruited to a company here in St. George to fix their wireless market. So I brought my wife and I home, which we were looking to start a family. So we were excited about that. And as soon as my wife got pregnant, I got this pinch of anxiety of like, oh no this isn't gonna work, like I've gotta go create something for myself. And so when my daughter was six months old, we packed up all of our belongings and moved to Houston, Texas to start a marketing company. So we had no guarantee of anything. We had secured a contract with the Houston Astros to do publications on their concourse for the Wall Street Journal and the Houston Chronicle, and we knew we had one season. The good thing about baseball is they've got a lot of games. So I had about a six month runway to see if I could figure this thing out. And we ended up building that sales organization all across the United States. In our last year there, we paid out over a million dollars in commission to our reps. And then when my son was born, it was like, okay, it's time to come back to St. George. And again, I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I loved helping people. I've, I loved finance, so I started a financial practice, and that was challenging. Uh, but luckily, a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, I heard how you were talking to your wife about the finances, the way that we managed our, our own household finances, right? Because we had a budget for our family and my wife had gone over her budget line by $5 and we had a conversation about it because that's what a budget is, you can't go over it. And he had said to me, you know, no one at our company has ever treated our company's finances the way you treat your families. They've been in business for 30 years but they've just never figured that out. And so he asked me to be the CFO of the Cliff Rose. It's a beautiful, beautiful property right outside of Zion National Park and in doing that we realized that we wanted bless you a lot of sneezes up here in the front we realized that we wanted to uh, join the Hilton or the Marriott collection and really take that next step as a property and that's how vibrant was born because through that process we realized that we needed to have a management company so we kind of created vibrant just really ultimately to fill that need and that was almost six years ago and now we've got properties all over the United States we're in Florida New Mexico Arizona Utah Illinois, Massachusetts, and Washington. And so we've had a bunch of awesome growth and that's really what brought me here today. And it was really in, we go one more for me, AJ. It was really in COVID that I realized that I wanted to start to share this message of winning the moment because I'd had some really good success finally for the first time in my life as an individual. Because I've shared with you guys the success that I've had professionally and I always succeeded professionally, it was never a problem. The problem was I could never do it for myself. Right, so if my boss said I need you to be at work at six o'clock in the morning, I was there at 5.50. But if I told myself I need to be at the gym at six o'clock in the morning, or I need to do whatever it is that's gonna make me a better version of myself, I could never do it. I could only do it if someone else was counting on me. So if I had a friend who was gonna meet me at the gym, no problem, I'd be there. But if that friend tells me he's not coming today, well then neither am I. And so I realized that I needed to find a way to succeed the same way personally as I always had been able to professionally. And that's really how winning the moment was born. So what I want to do is just take a quick minute and get you guys into the right mindset before we jump into winning the moment stuff. So you guys probably have notes or a computer or some way of jotting this down. I want you to just go through and write these down. This is my nighttime journal. This is how I end my day. It's really, really important to, to, to express and practice gratitude. And if you have a hard time with that, I want you to think of it this way. Imagine if you weren't grateful for something, it disappeared tomorrow. When you think of it in that mindset, it makes you a lot more grateful, right? Because like, you may not be grateful for Chick-fil-A, but if it disappeared tomorrow, that might suck, right? And so I want you to think of it in that way. Three big wins that you had. Now you can do this for yesterday since it's early. Anything you're struggling with right now. And then I like to think about what's on the docket for tomorrow. 
Because what I found is if I write it down before I go to bed, my mind will work it out while I'm sleeping. So I'm gonna give you guys just a minute and jot that down. This is the first opportunity for participation. So if you've got something down and you're willing to share, just raise your hand and we'll have you share it. Oh, did someone raise their hand? I missed it. Yes, what's your name? Zach. Zach, what do you got for us? Uh, That's awesome, I love that. And it's really important too, when you think about wins, I don't want you to think of society's definition of winning because the only way that winning the moment works is if it's a win for you. So for every single one of you, your wins are gonna be different. Anyone else wanna share something? Yes, sir. Right, something I wanna ask, uh, for question, what do you mean by that? Just oh, sorry, yep, I didn't talk about that. That's something that I have I'm trying to figure out that I just don't know, right? It's so like if there's something on my mind that I'm trying to figure out, or a problem I'm trying to solve. I like to write it down, see if my brain can figure it out for me at nighttime. Anyone else want to share any, anything that they wrote down? Yes, what's your name? No, no I'm Jeremy. Jeremy. Uh, no snow really this year. Are you grateful for that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I don't know, some people like the snow. Okay, there you go, I love that. Thank you for participating, Jeremy. What about someone else? Anyone got a struggle they want to share? That one's a little more difficult. Yes? I'm struggling with that end of the semester laziness where I'm okay. just everything off until the last second. Okay, so let's talk about that. So time procrastination, when is the end of semester? Is that like now? It's like a week and a half, two weeks from now. Okay, do you typically procrastinate? Um, depends on the subject. Generally, no, but if it bores me, yeah. Okay, so do you feel like that's bad? Yeah. So what I would say is if it bores you, then so what, you know? Like, we're not going to enjoy everything that we do. And it, as long as it doesn't bring you stress and make you feel worse, and if you want to say the thing you like the least till the end, I like to start with what I like the most in the beginning, right? And there is no right or wrong way, but I think that's a really good thing. And at least if you're putting it out there, you're aware of it, right? What was your name? Jace. Jace, thank you. Anyone else want to share anything? Yes, sir. What's your name? Tanner. Tanner. Okay, how, how overdue were you? Like 500 miles. Oh, that's okay, you would have been all right. That's a good win though. Okay, so there's probably someone in this room right now who doesn't like to share or is afraid to share. What I'd ask you is just lean into that because once you do it, you're gonna find that everything's fine, nothing changed, you're gonna be okay. So someone who's really afraid to share, would you be willing to? Yes. Even that half hand raise, right? You weren't even totally sure. All right, that's great. Okay, you do it, uh, AJ. Okay, so now what I want you guys to do, I found that so many of us know what the answers are for the questions that we seek, right? And in fact, I talked to a professor today who said, I wish my students could write the paper and read it as if they believed in it than looking to be perfectionist. So there's so many things that we actually know the answers to, we just can't see it within ourselves. If someone else could give us that same advice, we would take it. And so what I want you guys to think about is what advice would your 85 year old self give you today? So if you'd go into time, you've lived 85 years, you've had an incredible life, and you were now talking to yourself today in this room, what are the three pieces of, pieces of advice you'd give to yourself? So if you guys take a minute and jot that down. Yes. Party it up, you know. <laughs> hey, that, that very well might be one of the pieces of advice and that's okay. Okay, so uh, uh, yes. I was gonna say, I feel like a lot of things we're stressed out about just in the long term is really not relevant. So even like you were saying, just raising your hand and saying something in class, like, yeah. it's really not a big deal. Yeah, you get sweaty and get all nervous about it, but you're going to be fine. And you're so true that the things that, the stresses that we have for maybe tomorrow, right? Sometimes we're afraid of the next day or the next thing we have to do. But the thing is, you always get through tomorrow. So the stresses of tomorrow was, was at one time a stress of today, but you're going to get through it. Does anyone else have a piece of advice they would give themselves? Yes. Um, like, don't take yourself too seriously. Oh, I love I that. I find myself very focused and serious, which is Yeah, don't create something that doesn't need to be there and don't be afraid to have fun. What was your name? Ember. Was it again? Ember. Ember? Yeah. Thank you, Ember. Uh, my name is Gil. I would say that um, I'll say to myself to be more careful about my choices. More careful about your choices. Do you have an example you want to share about that? Uh, it's really personal. Let's do it. Okay. Talk to me after and let's talk about it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I feel like big ones is a joint process or something. 
feel like a lot of people say an end goal in sight, and you're so fixated on that, so by the time they actually reach it, it kind of feels a little underwhelming because they weren't really focused on progress throughout the way. So you actually stole like slide 12, but you're absolutely right. We're going to talk about that. What else? Someone who's, who hasn't shared yet. Someone who's afraid to share. Oh, did you raise your hand right there in the red watch? A little half hand raise, maybe? Yep, you. I did not. Well, what, what, what advice would you give your 85-year-old self? Uh, probably just don't really. I mean, school is important, but don't really stress about it. Like, it's not, it's not worth it. Yeah, stress is not a healthy thing, right? So it, it really depends on you defining what you want for yourself. If you want to have a good GPA, if that's, and sorry for the teachers in the room, if you really want a good GPA and that's important to you, then get it. But if you just want to graduate and that's important to you, then do that, right? Like, uh, let's not get stu stuck in society's definition or even this uh, institution's definition of success. It really depends on what you want. I think the thing that I, one of the things I wish I could have known is that I got the right to choose what success was, right? Because I probably started out chasing something that someone told me I was supposed to have without ever taking the time to decide what I wanted for myself. So I did this exercise uh, at the Summit of Greatness. Does, raise your hand if you know who Lewis Howes is. Oh, he'd be very disappointed. Did you raise your hand? I got one. Okay. So he's got an awesome podcast called The School of Greatness. Interviews a bunch of amazing people. Puts on this summit every year in his hometown of Columbus. And this was a question that he posed to us, and I found it really profound. Will you go forward for me, AJ? So, oh. Oh, yeah, one more. So these are the things that I came up with in that room for myself that day. Number one, your most valuable asset is time. I probably had the miss, or I didn't probably did have the misconception when I was younger that my most valuable asset were assets, money and material things. Like that's what I was after. That's why I was trying to succeed. Number two, don't waste any energy on who you are supposed to be. Instead, be who you are. And this is one I even still struggle with today because at the end of the day, I am just myself. But for some reason, I find that difficult to be which I don't know why, because I am just me. However, when you see things that you want or you aspire to, like I want to be a great speaker, and there are great speakers who exist, so I watch them, and I think even subconsciously I try and be who they are, and I get lost about being who I am. And even as I come up here and share my message and I have that feeling of fear I shared with you guys, I have to remind myself that it's not like this is a test. AJ doesn't have all the answers, it's my message. So I really can't do it wrong. I could maybe do it better, but I can't be wrong. And so I think it's so important, especially for this young generation that's in front of us here today, is really determine who you are and find yourself and be that best version of yourself. Because there's only one of you anyways, right? Especially with social media, you see people having success, like, well, let me duplicate that. But ultimately they're successful because they're being them. And this th number three was really the most important one for me. You guys kind of shared that sentiment a little bit in the room, but it's all gonna be okay. Because as I'm dealing with things in life and I have worries and I have stresses and things that being conservative that I worry about working out. When I, when I looked at this and I thought, man, what would my 85 year old self really say? And that's that no matter what I'm going through, it is all going to be okay. And when you have that perspective, it makes the nuances of the day a little bit easier. So now I want to talk about a study that kind of elaborates some of what we're going to be talking about here today. And so this was done by a Marine. They did a study of 2,500 people who tried to keep a promise for 21 days. Now the unique part about this study is that it's not like you had to choose from a list of what you wanted to make a promise to. You got to decide for yourself. So it could be, I'm not going to have soda, or I'm only going to watch Netflix for an hour, I'm going to read 10 pages every day. It doesn't matter what it is, it's just a promise that you made to yourself. So does anyone know why they did 21 days? Yes? Is that the amount of days before yeah, maybe, right? That's probably what they thought. I really don't know for sure. But I'd imagine that's what it was. But it's not too long, right? That's not an extreme amount of time. Uh, go ahead to the next one for me, AJ. Let's get some guesses on how many people you think out of 2,500. Raise your hand and take a guess how many people you think were able to keep their promise to themselves. Yes? 200. 200. Okay, let's get some other numbers. From the back row. Red hat. Three in. Yep, you. 25. Okay, not a bad guess. Yes, G. How many? 58. 58. Okay, can I get another guess? 2,500. Wow, okay, there we go. Now we got the spectrum. That's what I was looking for. So we had as low as, did you say 25? As low as 25 all the way to 2,500. So almost no one kept their promise to everyone kept their promise. Now what's interesting about that is that most of the people in the room had a very small number. But why would that be? Why would so few people be able to keep a promise to themselves? Any, any thoughts on what that would be? Yes? I just think like about New Year's resolutions. Yeah. Those get broken day one. Like, 
Yes. The con you know, we're always sharing it with people, and we're like, oh, we're going to work on this year, but those hardly, hardly ever come to fruition. And why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know if there was not enough actual, you know, set up in actually making plans to achieve that actual goal if you feel like it's actually something that you can achieve. Um, yeah, that's just my it's a quandary, right? Because even a New Year's resolution is probably a bigger promise than these people making yeah. it, oh. right? But yet, still, that that premise is true. Yeah, you raise your hand. I was just gonna say, I think that, like, as humans, like, we do the easiest thing that comes our way, or at least yeah. we the easiest route. So when we challenge ourselves with something that's just between us, it's at the end of the day, we get home from work, we're tired, and we're like, okay, we're gonna pass this day. Easy to make excuses for ourselves. I like to say that an excuse is a lie that we tell ourselves, right? Because we rationalize, like you just did. You have to go to the gym, you get home, you're like, well, I'm tired, and it's probably better for my body if I rest today, and I'll do it tomorrow. It's all just bullshit that we tell ourselves, right? And then you raise your hand. Our society, a lot of people just want it now. And so Absolutely. Like, once you start getting momentum with going to the gym, and you start seeing the results, and people tell you that, hey, you're looking good, then it's easy. I mean, it, you see progress. Right, it's just hard to get to momentum. Yeah. Absolutely. So does someone raise their hand over here? Yeah, let's do you. I think... Uh, a lot of people expect that the happiness that they get and like the joy that they get from getting the that 21 day goal yeah. is going to make it's going to carry them through the entire time but it doesn't unless you enjoy all 21 days getting there it's exactly what he said focus on the journey also be careful of all be happy when moments right because if you say to yourself i'll be happy in 21 days then what you've said to your subconscious is i can't be happy now Right, like my happiness is predicated on this end goal I'm trying to achieve, but really you've got to appreciate every single moment of it because if not, and you get to the end and you're still not happy, that's when depression sets in because now you're like, oh shit, what do I do now? Yes. Yeah, I was just going to say habits are usually just hard to form. Like, yeah. I mean, even when there's resolutions, like, I mean, unless it just logistically makes sense to start at New Year's, I feel like you're pushing something back until then. Like, that's almost just an excuse to put it off until uh, Absolutely. That's what start now. Absolutely. Well, and, and I'll be honest, the reason that I created this philosophy for myself is because I needed tools. Because I couldn't do it for myself either. Professionally, I could. But as an individual, I couldn't. I would have wanted, I would have been one of the 2,500 who couldn't do it. So uh, go to the next one. So the number of people who did it was 58. So that's 2% of people. Only 2% of people were able to uh, keep their promise to themselves. Who, was that you, G? Did you get it? Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, you've seen it before. You cheated. Uh, so there's about 100 people in this room. Right? So that means only two people in this room could keep their promise to themselves. That is terrible and terrifying. Right? Like as, a, as, a, as an employer of people, that's a bad statistic for me. That only two people can keep their promise. Now here's what they found. Pain, emotional, and physical, that makes sense, right? If something is challenging to us emotionally or difficult to execute, like going to the gym, that would be a reason. I forgot seemed silly at first, but then I thought about how many things I said I was going to start. Like, oh, I'm going to start reading at nighttime. And then I went to bed and the next morning I was like, oh. I forgot I was going to do that. Lack of support. This one's really important. It's so important that the circle of people that you surround yourself with want you to succeed in whatever way that you want to succeed. Because once you start to change, if the group you surround yourself with isn't willing to change with you, then when you start those positive habits, they're going to be like, why are you doing that? That's not what you do. That's dumb. Right? And it's very, very difficult to succeed if you don't surround yourself with the right people. And then the last one is uh, what we say to ourselves, right? This is kind of to your point. Is it Jeremy? Yeah. Jeremy, right to your point is that right before it starts to work, we say this is stupid and we stop. Right before we get to the momentum, before someone says we look good, we stop doing it. And that's ultimately why I created Winning the Moment. So now I'm going to get into the, the heart and, and bones of this. And there's three things that any good talk should cover. This is good for you guys to know when you guys are giving a presentation in school. These are the only three things that matter. AJ, you can go again. What, so what, and the last one is now what. This is what matters. What am I talking about? So what, why is it important? And now what, what do I do with that information? So what I want to do is create a paradigm shift in the way that we think about our activities. So a paradigm shift is defined as any way of doing a new activity is different than, you ha than how you have done it previously. And as I thought about a paradigm shift, I thought, man, how can I elaborate that or, or show that in a slide? And so this is as close as I got. Did anyone get the joke? Yeah, it's just silver Close. It's a paradigm. My wife didn't think it was funny either. But so that's what we're really talking about with winning the moment. AJ, if you go to the next one. So I want you guys to think for a minute, why does winning matter? Why am I talking about this? Why do you think that is? 
And we'll just raise hands. Anyone have an idea why I think it matters, Jeremy? You ain't first or last. Not quite. <laughs> yes. It's true, but no. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. What was your name? Chloe. Chloe. Well said. Anyone else have an idea why winning matters? <laughs> it's not fun to lose. Yes. Well, I mean, it's kind of what you talked about is that always looking forward to the I'm only happy when I can really put a damp on things. I've done that my entire life. But by making the small wins, you can continue to push forward and set little goals. So that at the end of the 21 days, you can say, yeah, I did. Absolutely. I did if you want to run a marathon, it's not the 26.2 miles that matter. It's every time you put your shoes on, yeah. right? Go to the next one for me. So uh, when I was writing my book, I realized that there was um, an actual study for this. It's called the winner effect. And so uh, this is Dr. Ian Robertson. And he said, success, success changes the chemistry of the brain, making you more focused, smarter, more confident, and more aggressive. The effect is as strong as any drug. And the more you win, the more you the more will you go on to win. But the downside is that winning can become physically addictive. But I want to use that addictiveness as a positive, right? Because what happens is once you create momentum in any direction you're going, it'll continue. So if the momentum is going positive and forward for you, that's the way it's going to go. But negative momentum is just as, as impactful and maybe even more dangerous. And so what I want to do for you guys is create that momentum for yourself, so that belief in yourself, right? Because if you get one win today, and oftentimes, for me at least, it starts with my alarm clock, right? Because I love to snooze. I will snooze for 40 minutes. I love it. I don't know why. I just think it's awesome. But I know that I have to stop it because it's bad for my health. And I also is putting my day 40 minutes behind. And I'm breaking the very first commitment I made to myself that day. Because if I said no matter what time it is, 9, 10, 11, 8 o'clock in the morning, it doesn't matter. If I said I need to get up at this time to achieve these activities and I don't do that, I've already given myself permission to fail. Right? I've set that negative momentum loop in and I've already said to myself, I don't care what I say I'm going to do. So by having my alarm clock be my first win, go to the next one for me, AJ. Because um, now we're talking about how you win the moment. So I, I imagine there's about 10 decisions in a day that can change the course of, of how your day is going to be. Right? And what I realize is I'm really bad at definitive forever statements. So if I said I'm going to go to the gym every day for the rest of my life, and I missed it today, I'll just never go again because I already like failed the challenge, right? And so I had to figure out for myself, how can I break that down into smaller decisions? So now when I woke up this morning and my alarm clock went off, all I did is I took one bracelet from one wrist and I moved it to the other. Because what we're trying to achieve is dopamine, right? That's what keeps us moving. And so when you have a checklist and, and maybe you've accomplished everything on the list, you did something extra, you write that down and you check it off. It's because it feels good, right? And so part of this is creating that momentum for myself, giving myself a reason to be good in the evenings because I'm generally decent in the mornings, I'm solid in the middle of the day. About 9 o'clock at night is when my day falls apart. My wife's asleep, my kids are asleep, no one's holding me accountable to anything. So that's when I might have a glass of whiskey, I might stream some Netflix, and I'll usually have a sandwich. Like, it's all bad. So I needed something to put some value in those decisions at the end of the day. Because a bowl of ice cream isn't going to change the course of my life. But if I have one every day, at some point it will. Right? At some point it'll have a negative impact. But I can never get myself to think of it in that perspective. So now I don't have to decide to never eat ice cream again. I just have to decide to not eat it right now. And what I'm really after anyways is the dopamine. So by going and deciding tonight I'm not going to have the ice cream and I move a bracelet, now I'm getting the dopamine the ice cream is going to give me anyways. My biggest midday struggle would be like about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I want some sugar. I want something to get me through. And so I go to the break room, I grab a Snickers, I eat it, I feel good for a second, but then instantly I have the regret of like, why did I have that Snickers? I didn't want that, I just wanted to feel good, right? And so now this bracelet, by moving that, is going to replace that for me. And now I've got the chance to win the day. Because if I can do it 10 times, now I've won the day. And then I've also got, you know, we talked about lack of support. Well, I've got a community supporting me now because everyone in my life knows what I'm doing. So they can look at my wrist and see if I'm doing good. In fact, one night my wife was going to bed and she said, what are you going to do? I said, I think I'm going to have a drink and watch the game. She said, are we going to win the day? And I was like, oh, I hate when you use it against me. But yes, and so I did. I went, to, I went, I read, I did my journal, and I was in bed by 10. And that changed the course of my next morning. Because if you win the night, my probability of winning the morning is infinitely higher. Where I know if I lose the evening, I'm never going to win the morning.
And so the thing that I think is so important with this is you have to have a purpose and a why tied to it. So I think to your statement about New Year's resolutions, the reason I feel like they don't succeed is there's not enough of a purpose. Most New Year's resolutions are just whatever we think they're supposed to be, right? But if you have a real purpose to why you're doing something, you're going to be infinitely more successful. Now, finding your why is a really hard thing to do. Mark Twain says, the two most important days in your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. I think that's absolutely true because when we have a purpose, we're so much more able to achieve the thing that we're after. So what I'd like you guys to do is just take a minute and think about what your why is. And I want you to all understand that this is something that will change throughout your life. Your why today is not the same why that you'll have 10 years from now. But I'd love to know if anyone is willing to share, and I'll give you a minute to think about, but what is your why right now? What's your purpose? Is it partying, Jeremy? No, I'm just about to swim the fastest. Say it again. I was the fastest swimmer. Oh, you're a swimmer? Yeah. That was your purpose. Uh, actually, I didn't do that so. Anyone want to share a purpose? Take care of my kids. That's a great purpose. Makes things a lot easier when you have that a big reason why you got to do something. Right? And purpose is hard to share. It can be kind of intimate. It can be a little bit private. But what I'll tell you is the more you're willing to share it, the more support and community you're going to have. If someone knows that you're working towards something, your friends, your family, your peers, then they're going to help you succeed. It's really valuable to share that. Anyone else want to share a purpose? Yes. Setting up my future. So I'm working full time right now, but I'm also taking 18 credits. And so it's really hard to find yeah. But I know what I'm after is just success. And right now, I just have to go through it. And eventually, it'll pay off. Since I'm in my senior year, I'm like, just do it. Just You're do close. It, so you, you actually pick up a really great point, And I'm glad that you said that. Will you raise your hand if you feel like you're successful? OK, so that's about 30% of the classroom. Now raise your hand if you wanted to go to college. Participate, please. Okay, so that's probably about 60%. So the reason that I ask that is that so often, to your point, like now you're, you're, you're focused on the next thing, right? And so if you wanted to go to college and I asked if you're successful and you didn't raise your hand, it's because you're probably focused on the next thing, right? But you're where your previous self wanted to be right now. And it's so easy in life to get caught up on where you're supposed to be versus where you are. So I want all of you to understand that just because you don't have the next thing that you want, the career you're trying to set up, it doesn't mean you're not successful right now. And I'd love you to, to answer for the class, what do you think success is? How do you define success? Um, I guess happiness in a way. That's a great answer. Do you have to do all the things you're doing to be happy? Do you have to do the 18 credits in the future and all of that? <laughs> right, so just be thinking about that, yeah. right? So be thinking about that because what you could potentially be chasing is what you think you're supposed to chase. But if what you're really trying to chase is happiness, you may already have it, right? You don't have to work so hard. Go to the next one. Okay, so we're talking a lot about being present and being in the moment. And so sometimes people get lost with me thinking that that doesn't mean to think about your future. Now, as humans, we have a tendency to overestimate what we can do in a year. Um, Vishen Lakhani, he wrote a couple good books, Code of the Extraordinary Mind, Buddha and the Badass, uh, and then um, Six Phase Meditation. And he says, that's his quote, that we have a tendency to overestimate what we can do in a year, but underestimate what we can do in three years. Another reason New Year's resolutions fail, we stack too much stuff on, right? But when we think about it three years out, we have a tendency to think less of what we can accomplish. So I want all of you to think about a big, hairy, audacious goal and have that thing that's three years down the road that you're working towards. Don't lose sight of being present in the moment, but have that thing that's that milestone that you're after. For you guys, it could be graduation, it could be a, a litany of things, but have that in your mind. We'll skip this for today since we're running short on time. So this is the, a message I really think is important for you guys. It's that, it's that you have to be where you are right now in order to get where you're going, and you can't start the journey at the finish line. Anyone know who said that? Dr. Seuss, good guess. Anyone else? AJ? That was me, I said that. 
So this is a really important message, I think, because as you guys are starting your journey, it's so easy to look at what someone else has and think like, oh, I want that. I want to have that thing. But we're all in our own race. And I think it was you that said, this is your slide right here, this one you talked about. You got to focus on the journey because if you put all of your happiness and your aspirations on that finish line, you're going to get there and feel deflated. And don't compare yourself to anyone else because you have no idea where they are in their race. And I can share that when I started out in my career and I had some friends who were what I deemed at the time to be successful, really high income earners, I thought like, man, I'd give anything to trade places with them. And then I saw the impact it had on their family life and their mental health and I would never trade that now. But at the time I didn't know that. So I was envious of something that with the knowledge I have them today, I wouldn't even want. And then the other thing that I think makes all this easier, what, what, no matter what you believe, I'm not a religious person, but I do believe in the universe, and I believe the universe will give you everything that you want in life. And I found that to be true for me and so many others, and, and you can change that. It can be interchangeable with whatever word you want. But what I would challenge you guys on is to be clear about what the things are that you want, and be present and be aware and be looking at the signs. Because sometimes the sign might be as obvious as someone giving you something or having a direct conversation. Sometimes it might be like a billboard on the freeway. If you're not paying attention, you're going to miss it. But the more cued into this you are, the better you're going to be able to reach your dreams. And the message I'll leave you guys with is that your next moment starts now. So every single one of you are on your own journey and all of you have the ability, this is your now what, to decide today like I'm going to start to move towards the things that I want. And that's everything that I have for you guys. This is all my contact information right here as so you guys connect with me in a bunch of different ways. I'm hanging out here with AJ for a bit if you guys want to chat. But I do want to open it up for questions. Do you guys have any questions that I can answer for you? How do you find your balance? Uh, that's a great question. For me, it's about deciding what's important and making my wins relevant to that. Like this is not meant to be like hustle culture, get up at five o'clock in the morning, work for 20 hours a day. Like I don't like to work after five. I don't like to work on the weekends, I like to have that time for my family. So I think aligning my activities with my goals is how I find that balance. Thanks for participating today. You get bracelets and a book. Oh, thank, thank you, you Jeremy. <laughs> yeah. Who else has a question? Yeah. So I did summer sales. Okay. Okay. Uh, in personal revenue. Okay. Now, I did not achieve that. Yeah. I felt really bad about myself. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't say I went in a bad place, but I definitely wasn't in a good place. So when, and I was doing like all these mindset things, pushing, pushing, and pushing. So where would you say, so I guess my question is, how do you come back from not achieving that goal, even though you did all the steps to achieve it? I guess what I'd ask you is in your heart of hearts, did you try your hardest every single day? Like, do you know that you had nothing else to give? Like every day you were the best version of yourself every time someone answered that door, no matter what? Definitely not. That's what I would focus on. Because you can do all the mindset stuff and like do all the things, but if your activity aligned with that, right, then it's gonna fall short. And so I think that you either reevaluate and say, was my goal appropriate? or is my behavior is appropriate? Because if you didn't go to every single door as the very best version of yourself, then you're not gonna achieve the ultimate success that you're after. And it's a really hard thing to look internally and say like, because what people always wanna do is put on someone else. I was in a bad market. What were you selling? Okay, uh, we, we didn't have enough market share. I didn't get the good routes. Like it's so easy to put that onus on someone else. But the second you put it on yourself, you're gonna be able to change that. And so what I would say for you is mentally as you're approaching the door, ask yourself like, what am I mirroring? Is this, is this the best version of me? Am I gonna instantly make friends with the people at the door? Thank you for, for asking. Can you pass that back yeah. to him for me? Is, is that helpful, do you think? Yeah. Okay, you were next. Uh, you talked earlier about not stressing about being who you like should be in a society or anything along those lines. Uh-huh. Just being yourself. But I've seen people talk about being like acting as if you were the person that like your your ideal self. Like if you yeah. Wanna, if you wanna if you could think of your best self and there have X, Y, and Z of different personality traits yeah. things to just fake that now and then eventually you'll just become that person. But do you do you think you should like is that, how does that align with what you're saying? No, I think that's right. As long as it's who you really want to be, right? As long as you're not like, oh, here's this person. I want to be him. So let me act like he does. If you're saying this is who I want to be, but I'm not there yet, but I'm going to emulate it as much as I can. I think absolutely that's a positive. In fact, just yesterday I was on a call with uh, an investor for a property in Colorado and I was trying to negotiate 5% ownership for myself. And this gentleman started um, with the Waltons, with Walmart. That was like, he was their, their 
private equity person. So he's about 72 years old. He's more brilliant than I could ever be. And I asked for something that I maybe shouldn't have asked for. And then he hit me with all these questions. And I was like, oh, shit, I don't, I don't even know what he's talking about. You know? So I had to pretend like I knew what I was doing and emulating who I want to be, but knowing like I didn't yet have the knowledge. And so if I don't get what I sought after, it's going to be a lesson that I, was, I asked too prematurely. But I wouldn't change trying to be in the room that I wasn't yet ready for. Because through that, I'm going to learn what I needed to know. We've got time for one more question. So going about all these, finding the small winning, the wins in the day, you obviously seem like you're very happy. How do you continue to find, like, drive is what I'm trying to say. Because most people, it's money, it's a certain milestone. If you're happy right now, yeah. why push more? Why not just stay stagnant? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I love the word stagnant, but I'm just going to be the best I can every day. And if I do that every day, it's going to multiply into other successes. Uh, and I think that I still have those goals and aspirations that I'm working towards, right? Like I want to be a really good professional speaker in three years, which means I have to come here today and be okay. And then tomorrow I'll be better. And the next talk I'll be better. But at the end of the day, I'm just going to focus on the little things in front of me, right? And I think that I think it can be really dangerous when you put so much anticipation in the future. And I think you already said you struggle with that. Because then when you get there, you may not feel the way you thought you were. But you're also telling your own subconscious, like, OK, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. The only place you can be is where you are. So just focus on that. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you.